Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Heather Havenwood, and thank you so much for being here today. As always, I'm bringing you amazing people in life that are just living extraordinary lives around the planet, and today is no different. Uh, so today, I have someone here that I am actually excited to have a conversation with because he lives an extraordinary life, and I think that's what we're all here to do. You know, uh, that's what I'm here to do. That's why I left a corporate America a long time ago. So I'm going to introduce you who that person is. Eric Severson has lived an extraordinary life. Like I was saying from hitchhiking from London to central Africa, to living with the remote Indian tribe in the Amazon to building a successful business, because you know, that's kind of normal to do that. And Eric has forged a path filled with extreme adventure and extreme success. His current passion is showing people how to discover a greater sense of meaning by adding belonging, purpose, and storytelling into their lives. Awesome. And his first book is coming out in late 2018, probably next month in August. So that's kind of fun too. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Heather. It's great to be here. I love your show. So I'm happy to be on it. Oh, thanks. Okay. So, um, hitchhiking's odd. That's, yeah. that's new. What year was that? That was 1989, and and it's a too it's too bad that hitchhiking isn't kind of what it used to be. When I was doing it in 1989, it was already kind of a thing that was kind of past. In the 70s, it was normal. When I was doing it, it wasn't quite normal, but it still could get by. And I wish that it still existed today because I met so many unique and interesting and fabulous people hitchhiking. And also, it was the cheapest way for a just turned 20 year old to get from London to Kinshasa <laughs> in in the Congo. To the Congo. I mean, first of all, how many miles is that? That's got to be. Oh, geez. Thousands and thousands. Right. Um, I, I just kind of looking at the globe in my head, I'm going to guess it was about 5,000 miles how that I did. How long did it take you? It took me three and a half months. To go from London to Con Congo? Yeah. Right. And you just like hitchhiked and stayed in hotels and stuff? I mean, uh, no, a lot of it, there was, there were no hotels. And, and I, I occasionally take a train when I, there was something I had to get across. I took a boat from Spain across Gibraltar to um, Morocco, of course, so did that. And I'd be on market trucks sometimes and a uh, shared taxi from time to time crossing a border where they wouldn't let me go alone. But why do it? Was it just like this whole like, let's do London to Congo hitchhiking? Or were you trying to get somewhere? You're always no. not from London. What, uh, why that trajectory? Okay, so first I read um, my history books about Africa and then I read a novel by Chinue Achebe called Things Fall Apart. And I said to myself, this doesn't say anything that my history books talked about. And I'm, you know, about 19 years old at the time. And I just said to myself, I want to see it for myself. So I researched getting to Africa and it was really expensive to fly there. And so um, as a 19 year old, with not a lot of money. I mowed lawns and raised enough money and I, I could afford a ticket to London, but I couldn't afford a ticket to Africa. <laughs> so I landed in London. The only reason I went to London was because it was the cheapest ticket to Europe at the time. Oh my, okay. So I just have to ask, what was your family thinking at the time? You know, they said no initially, and it took me a lot, lot of convincing for my parents to, to convince them that, yeah, I should be able to do it. I'm going to be responsible. And knowing what I know now, I was in some dangerous positions. I had a knife pulled out on me. I had a gun stuck in my mouth, literally in my mouth. So there were some precarious positions that I was put in, but I was uh, as smart as possible. And I, did ha I learned how to rely on people when I needed to. And that's kind of one of my life lessons now is being vulnerable can be a good thing because people, when you're vulnerable, are so willing to go out of their way to help you. And I learned that on that trip, which is great. That's an interesting story. So have you written a book about that story yet? That, that there are a few chapters in my book coming out that are about Africa and kind of like the pinnacle of my life was like machine gun in my mouth by a policeman in Nigeria. And, and that was when I learned how to overcome fear. And so that's kind of one of the big highlights uh, of the book. And there are a few other narratives, one living with the Berber tribe in Morocco for a few days and how, how generous and awesome they were to me. So yeah, there are quite a few narratives from Africa. I think out of the 22 narratives in my book, three or four are from Africa. I bet that, that entire trip kind of just changed your whole life is what it sure did. Um, it allowed me to see things in a different perspective. And again, I interpreted fear in a different way. I going into a village at dusk, not knowing a person, not knowing where I'm going to stay. Cause I walked huge sections too. I walked sometimes 60 miles in a row. Um, and I'd stumble across some village when it's getting dark and I don't know how they're going to accept me or not. And getting over my fear, approaching a village, making contact with somebody and, um, and, 
seeing what great things could come from that um, really shaped my business as well of when I get that nervousness before a big interview or get nervous before a big meeting. Um, I remind myself of this and I allow that to make me stronger. You know, this is a this is a great segue um, into some things that I've shared too. Travel. I, first of all, anytime that I can come across a college student at all, I always or a potential college student, I always tell them, you know, wherever you live right now, go to college really, really far, far away. I always uh-huh. them, don't go to college down the street. Like if you can go a bunch of states away, even better. You know. Yep. Um, or overseas, even better. You know, uh-huh. they're looking at me and like, you know, the parents are freaking out, but I'm like, you, know, you need to get out of your element. Yeah. And I did that. That was fun. The other thing that I did is I traveled the, I mean, I was thrown into traveling the country. And when you're, I was born and raised in Houston. I, I, we all have our own bubble. You know, uh-huh, yeah. a bubble and like, I never been to New York and Chicago and like in the middle of Peoria, Illinois, like people live here, you know? So I think it's just, and it's the only United States. The United States is pretty big, but yeah. this is a whole other level of international that when you're thrown into, and I've been in situations like that by myself where you're thrown into different countries where you don't, can't speak their language, maybe mm-hmm. culture, you obviously look like American and there's, there's a construct of American good or bad sometimes. Yeah. Know. Right. You don't have a say in that. There's, I feel like every single person should leave the United States or at least leave their bubble by five states and just go elsewhere and get yeah. out of their bubble. It just makes such a huge difference. And now I'm a person that I, I have no problem traveling anywhere. You know, I'm very aware, but I, I just, I'm just one of those people that I, I have no problem traveling by myself. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, Heather, for sure. I'm, I'm glad that you discovered that. I also, I moved away from two states. I went from Washington, grew up in Washington state and went down to UCLA for undergrad and then Virginia for grad school. So I really went back and forth across the country for school. And I agree with you. You get a multi-perspective. Yeah. And like you mentioned, the, tra- the traveling, there's so much within the states. So I've been to over 80 countries, but equally proud of that is that I've been to 49 of the states in the United States and I've met so many wonderful people with different cultures and different ways of thinking even within the United States and it's just beautiful so you don't have to go to Africa to to really see really, difference it's yeah, right really here figure it out um, I think one of the best things that a I think the Mormon culture does they do a quest of the, the when they're 18 the boys do quest. okay I think that's what it's called. They call it something that they go off on like a walkabout basically for two years. Yeah. And uh, I'm not Mormon, um, but I've met so many of, of people of, of Mormons that they talk about that those two years changed their life because they force them to go, you know, many, many States away, sometimes different countries uh-huh. to, for, for them. And they're like, I changed my life on my, on every, every relationship I've had. It changes my view because I've, I'm in foreign land. Yeah, you, right. You've got to rely on yourself and you've got to rely on strangers and you've got to trust people. And uh-huh. I think that's a huge part of business. I think entrepreneurs, that's what we have to do. We've got to be resourceful. And the number yeah. one thing when you're traveling, you've got to be responsible and mm-hmm. you've got to be resourceful. Absolutely. Right? And uh-huh. if you're not resourceful and you're not responsible, things can happen. Uh-huh. You know? And uh, so I just love that. So I love that what you're doing. So let's talk about more about um, what you do. What do you do now? Okay, so I've got a few things going on. I work with, for a company um, that we do motorcycle rentals. And the idea is providing dreams for people to come from Germany or Australia or Brazil or Argentina and come to America and ride bikes. Uh, and we do have international locations as well. It's called Eagle Rider. And we've got about 100 locations worldwide. And so it allows them to do what we were just talking about And then the motorcycle also makes them James Dean for the week or two that they're on the bike. And it's a great conversation for people. And then on top of that, I own a company called Innovative Educational Services. And it started by training English students, ESL students, how to travel abroad and be more successful, more than just the English part. And then it kind of quickly developed into a lot of them wanted it for business practices and it became more of a business training than, than, than English. So I do both, but it's really evolved into speaking and in the business training. And it's just absolutely wonderful to work with often these young people, either students or young professionals and see them grow and make these milestones have set goals with them that are way beyond their expectations and then work with them for a year and watch them receive it. So my next thing coming up is Saturday, I'm going to China to lead a, um, a training for students 
traveling abroad to learn English for two weeks. So it's an intensive English, but mindset and learning strategies training. Okay, so they're going to be traveling from China to the United States? Yep, from China to the States, um, UK, Canada, and Australia. So other English-speaking countries. Other yeah. English, and so you're going to be doing some training around, the, around that. Yeah. Okay, that's really, really cool. So what do you find, what's, what's great about this conversation is that if you're not uh, looking, let's say, like, let's say how, you're not Gen X, right? Okay, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're Gen Y with me, right? So I'm, I'm still Gen X. Are you Gen X? Yeah. I'm Gen X. Okay, you're not millennial. I'm Gen X. Okay? Yeah, right. Okay, so I got millennials messed up. Sorry, guys. All right, so you're not millennial. Yep. And what's the next generation right now? They're in their 20s. What's that? You know, I think we call millennial. I heard, I've heard Gen Y, Gen, well, you know, I've heard so many different things, but yeah, I People see. People that are in their 20s right now. Okay. Yeah, that's millennials. Right, the millennials continue. Okay, what do you find their biggest challenges right now are when they travel and when they're going abroad? What do you find that their biggest challenges are? Um, you know, one of them, and th there's, there's a huge positive to this, and there's a huge, huge negative, I think. One of them is the need to be connected so much. I think being connected is great. However, there's a time to really appreciate this elephant next to you or this waterfall in front of you, rather than spending 100% of the time looking through the screen at it so you can share it with your friends. Because I, I totally believe you should share these things with your friends on social media, etc. But share it for a few seconds. And then just stop and pause with the moment. Um, I've been to concerts when I've seen somebody in front of me who's probably in their young 20, early 20s hold up the phone for an hour and a half straight. Um, and for me, I think it's great. I want to hold it up for two minutes to show my buddies that I was at the X concert or whatever it was. But at the same time, when you're focused on that phone for the whole time, you're missing the reality that's right in front of you. So that's one. And I think a lot of the millennials, not... not a lot are traveling as much either. Some do, some don't. Um, but taking that step to get away from the bubble that you talked about yeah. and really step out is, uh, you find is really the millennials important. Right now, they're, they're, you're finding right now overall that they're not traveling as much as maybe our generation did? Uh, you know what? I might be, I know of some who do. So um, I'm not going to say that for sure. Right. Yeah, but but no, I, 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 I just want to. But I'm just like in general, like what do you I want to uh, yeah, stress the importance of the travel and, and being in the moment during it. Yeah. Um, but I, but I do think that the millennials, the, the way of thinking a lot of times there's a bad rap of, you know, not do, you know, not paying attention to jobs or staying, uh, you know, not being focused, all these you know, things. The fact is it's a different way of thinking. Just like, you know, when you and I grew up, it was a different way of thinking from the generation above. And I think that they need to understand the why going to Simon Sinek, you know, that was kind of hot. And, and so understanding the why with them is extremely important. Um, I was actually on a show millennial mastermind. Um, Brad Mulvey. And this kind of came up that I've repeated a few times since it's, it's, he, I said 100 years ago, people wanted a job to survive. 50 years ago, people wanted to get an education to get a comfortable career. Now people want meaningful experience in education, job and life. So there's no means to an end anymore. They want the meaning now. They want the experience now. Mm -hmm. And so if they're an entry level employee, you've got to show them why this experience is valuable to them and how they're valuable to the process. Otherwise, they're going to find something else. They're going to bolt, you know, that's so, okay, so this is really great conversation. Um, so I used to live on Marco Island. All right. Yeah, the average age is 80. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I was 35 and uh, that was interesting. And, but I did learn a lot about people who are retired and like that, that mindset, that's a generation of, that they spent 10, 20, 30 years in right. a job, yeah. um, corporate job, whatever, government job that they might not have liked for that one day, you know, to be yeah. retired and to be on the beach, you know? And I found it really fascinating because I got to spend all this time with these people and I got to really, there was like, I call it two kinds of retirees on the island. Uh -huh. Those between what you're saying. There's two kinds. One were like the grouches, you know, those guys, they're like, yes, oh, my lawn, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you do, they're just pissed, you know? Yeah. And they, usually I would start to like, what, you know, wh where'd you retire? They were always, and I'm just speaking generally, they were always like somewhere from the Northeast. Uh -huh. and they worked for some government job that like maybe, right. or maybe just worked for the government or some like manufacturing or whatever. They were from for 25, 30 years, did their time as they called it. And yeah. then now they, here we are. And they're just like pissed off, you know, the ones that were 
what I call still going, you know, they're like 70. They're like, I can barely walk, but we're going to the golf course. Let's bring the oxygen tank. Like whatever they were right. like, well, I'm still living, you know, they were the ones, if I talked to them, they had some kind of entrepreneurial world. Yep. It could have been a sort of business. It could have been one, but they had some kind of entrepreneurial experience in life yeah or military people that had traveled the world they yep. had a different view it was like yeah i might not be moving as much as fast but i'm still living i might not be working for that company but i'm still living there's still yeah. experience here yeah and I think that's what you're saying that like the old school was a little bit more like do your time yep. and then live exactly and the millennials were saying hell no mm -hmm. i'm living right and time doesn't sound so cool. So I'm just going to live, Yep. you know, and I, I find it refreshing being the sandwich. We're the sandwich. We're the sandwich generation. We got the baby boomers in front of us and we got the millennials behind us, but it's kind of like this sandwich between uh -huh. us of like, yeah, what is that like to not have to follow suit of our generation before us? Right. It's kind of cool. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and it's fun to kind of bridge that kind of difference. When I turned 40, it did nothing for me. It was no big deal at all. Um, yeah. Because I like the book, Douglas Adams, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 42 is a special number in the book. It's the answer to the meaning of life, the universe and everything, which is funny. So 42 was a special uh, day for me. And, and I made a big deal about it. And I started to analyze my life at 42. And I realized two things. One, I'm going to feel like a kid forever. Two, somebody who's 60 you know, 18 years older than me knows a lot more than I do. So I want to listen to them as much as I can. Yeah. So I, I, so I learned that I'm a kid and still w need to listen to people who are above uh, in front of me. And I, yeah, yeah, that's really smart. By the way, what was the name of the book again? Oh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Really funny book. It's a sci-fi book about just, it's just absurd. And just in a nutshell, yeah. the, the civilization creates a computer to answer the question, what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? And it takes, I think, six billion years for this computer to calculate the answer. So they have a whole society waiting for the answer. Six billion years later, the computer says, I have the answer, and I don't think you're going to like it. Then he tells them the answer is 42. <laughs> That's yeah. It? Yeah, that's it. And so the idea was the ultimate question and the ultimate answer couldn't exist in the same time at the same time. So it's kind uh, of funny. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to read that now. It's a I'm really sorry. fun one. I encourage you to look it up. Um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with someone recently in my life. And he, he said, I Googled today um, how to please a woman. And I said, <laughs> oh, really? How'd that go? He's like, it's still spinning. <laughs> it, doesn't, it hasn't come up with an answer. <laughs> that is really like, funny. <laughs> funny? That, yeah. Like, be careful. It might blow up your phone. So yeah. kind of like that. Like, what's the meaning of life, Google? Or like, yeah. oh, like the woman is still just like spinning. I, I, I asked a coworker one time a stupid question. And then she emailed, it was through email. And she emailed a response. And there was some app that she had. And it was, I think, called Let Me Google This For You. And so it just literally had fingers typing out the stupid question I asked her. And the Google response popping up. Like, yeah. of course, I could have found the answer myself rather than asking her what the answer was. Oh, it was good. That was, that's a millennial. Like, we'll just Google that. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell us about your new book coming out and tell us, a, you know, what that was and why now a, a, a book. What is that? Okay. Yeah. So um, it started, oh, so I had some multiple life experiences. I mentioned the machine gun yeah. in my mouth and hitchhiking and living with the okay. Indians. And Okay. Hold on. The machine gun in my mouth. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's like a big deal when you have a loaded machine gun in your mouth and you're yeah. not scary and you don't have a gun next to you. I mean, it, I just want to, just want to like not you know, just drop that in, but that's pretty a big deal, but go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, uh, yeah, it's a, that, that was a story in, in a very quick nutshell. I was crossing the border from Benning into Nigeria and we were, it was at a military checkpoint and we kept stopping. And one day, one time the, the taxi driver was in a shared taxi decides not to stop. And the, the guards didn't like that at all. So they yanked me out of the car. I thought I was a spy. So they, they yelled at me with guns in my head. They, they actually fired their weapons in the air chasing our car. Um, threw a spiked board in front of the car and then dragged, we had to stop, of course, then drugged me out of the car and I was the only non-African. So they focused all their energy on me. Right. And so, so, and in the end, um, I got out of it and every, everything worked out. So, so that's one of the 
22 narratives in this, this book. Some of them was hitchhiking down to a Grateful Dead show in the Rainbow Gathering in Oregon County Fair in 1988 and what that experience was like, you know. And so they're just, and some of them was when the Outlaw Motorcycle Club. Um, so different, some of them meeting a beautiful um, Indian in an Apache on a reservation and this friendship that we developed. So these life stories, and I divided them to four groups of belonging, purpose, transcendence, and storytelling, and how it gave me meaning because of these things. So there are pre and post chapters for each section, trying to ask people, how can you identify meaning in your life? Here's how I identified meaning in my life and purpose and, and happiness for that matter. What can you do to identify the meaning points in your life? Because we all, we've all got it. And so, like I said, it's called extra, ordinary to extraordinary. And the idea is I'm an average kid, grew up in uh, Tacoma, Washington, who ended up doing some really extraordinary things. And that's available to everybody willing to open the doors and just make it happen for themselves. And willing to open the doors and make it happen. Yeah. It's so true. I um, did my travel. I mean, nothing at the mm-hmm. extent, to be honest, but I traveled. Yeah. And I remember this one time, I'll never forget it. I was, um, tr- I don't even know how this happened. I was traveling between Oregon, uh, Portland. Uh-huh. And down to an, uh, through the Redwood Forest in this this other town. I don't remember. And I ended up, I asked some guy, a random guy in like this store. I said, I really want to like, you know, tour some wineries. And so he gave me an address. And so I just, you know, I Google it, you know, whatever. I found it. And yeah. I'm thinking winery, you yeah. know, and it was a house. Oh my gosh. It was a house and like they had some wine. And so I get there and I'm like, hi, I, somebody said I could come. And he's, he's like, oh yeah. So he sends me back and we start walking his little yard and uh-huh. he's got like two big vats and I'm like, great. And it's kind of hot. So he goes, well, why don't you come in the house? I'm literally in his house. Oh my gosh. I'm in his kitchen. Right. And his wife comes home and I'm like, hello. <laughs> and, like, and you are. And I'm like, uh, a tourist, I guess. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, right, like, right, exactly. In their kitchen, I use their bathroom. We had this conversation. Took a picture, and I'm just like, wow. You That's know, cool. That just, like happened, but yeah. I mean, and did he give taste of all his different wines? And oh yeah, like I tried his wine, had cheese. Yep. Sat and talked to his wife and him for like two or three hours, and I was like, I guess I gotta go. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. But, I mean, definitely not your hitchhiking story, but I'm sure you had thousands of those stories. But exactly, like, though. What's this like, you know, here's in America, North California, they're just opening their doors. Like, oh, come on in. You know, like, yeah. I just love that. I just think Me that- too. And, and, and you accepted it. Um, to, a lot of people say, oh, well, uh, you know, and they get nervous about why they shouldn't accept this, you know, random thing to be in a little winery in the kitchen drinking their wines, which is awesome. I love those stories. Yeah, it's so different. I mean, I checked in with my stomach, like is my serve, you know, but uh-huh. I'm like, yeah. I am, so it's all good. Okay, so the intention of the book, are you bringing in lessons into business or who's, who's the um, audience of the book? So the book, and the book developed, I started writing it for myself and I, so some of the narratives I started um, literally 20 years ago, kind of when they were happening. And then about t- t- maybe three years ago now, I started showing them to a few friends and um, realized it was kind of getting, they they liked them and they thought I should share them. So then I really organized it. And once I thought I was done, I had 44 narratives, 42. And then I decided, you know what, I want to show this to an editor. And the editor said, it's good for you. And, you know, maybe your friends, but to really be bigger, it needs to have a more central purpose throughout the book. So then I wove in the points of meaning of how people can discover it for themselves. And I, I divide it into sections. I cut out 20 of the 42 narratives and really made it more focused on somebody who's, it's for somebody who knows, has meaning in their life, they'll enjoy the adventures. Somebody who's coasting through with a job that they think is okay, but they know there's more to life. That's probably the main target it will encourage them to look inward and create connections. Um, so both inward and outward to find meaning and purpose in their life. And then lastly, I think it's for people who are desperately sad and nobody around them even knows it. They don't know why they don't have purpose in their life. They don't know why they don't have connections. And it gives little suggestions. There are some reflective questions at the end of every uh, section that, that I want people to ask themselves questions about, does my life have meaning? And if the answer is no, which a lot of us, it's going to be no. um, It kind of gives hints of how you can find it for yourself or how you can create it for yourself. So um, it's good for business. It's good for people not in business. Um, It's kind of like both the narratives on the one hand and then the self-discovery aspect on the other hand. Okay. So I noticed the 42 was in there. 
Uh huh. Yeah. And yeah. Then, you know what? That the funny thing is, I loved the forty two, but then I it was way too long, so I had to cut it in almost half. So the first book coming out is twenty two of the forty two, and then someday I'll probably gather the rest. But I just I this is kind of cool too. This just happened today. Books coming out very very soon, and I had a suggestion that I need to get have some blurbs on the inside cover page. So last week I contacted a few people that I know that are, you know, have written best-selling books, have owned, owned multi-million dollar companies. And I'm, I'm still too short because of the, not everybody, two of the people that I asked said they would do it. One of them's busy in Italy and one of them's in Denver. So they just couldn't get to it. So I need to have it done by tomorrow. So I just panicked and I wrote to a few other high level, a level influencers. I know one of them, um, David, uh, from from uh, join up dots, it's a, another really good good podcast. And so, in 24 hours, he read my manuscript, wrote back a hilarious, witty, awesome blurb for it, and and that just felt good. That there's a human out there willing to put everything aside and write a little blurb for something I've got going. Um, and and I I really really appreciated that. Yeah, David's it's awesome. Jordan Dots is great. I've been on his show, and he's phenomenal. He's a great storyteller. Yeah. That's awesome. I really I um. I, I get that, you know, uh, when I, and I want to share the story because I think it's, it pertains to you. And when I wrote my book, Sexy Boss, I wrote it for me. Uh -huh. I wrote it to get my story out and yep. I didn't know what was going to happen to the book. And mm -hmm. now it's been kind of a life of its own. It's been like going for three or four years. People know me as Sexy Boss and like, that wasn't the intention. The intention was to get my story out. Uh -huh. So in, in my, my own journey of stuff, right. So I love that. And you never know what is going to happen, you know, and I'm sure you're going to do a big launch and, and all that good stuff. But I know that for me, um, when I launched, I just kind of, I just put it out there and uh -huh. then I got like Ryan Dice and some of the big names, um, gave me huge testimonials and Joe Sugarman became forward. So I think it's, it's a, it's about the process, about the journey. Yeah. It's about getting your story out there. And my goal in my book back then was if one person, if, if I publish it and one person bought it uh -huh. and one person, it made a difference for one person, it was a success. That Absolutely. Was my, that was it, you know, and about three years after the publishing date, which was 2013, I was sitting on a podcast just like this, where I was the guest and this lovely woman says, congratulations on your book being number one bestseller on Amazon. And I said to her, you're so sweet, but you're incorrect. Like it's uh -huh. not. Right. She goes, yes, sweetheart. It is. And she shows me her screen and I'm like, Oh my God. You know, because then it was just so it, it reached a pinnacle beyond me. And I think that's what's going to happen to you. It's like, that's awesome. Yeah. You're getting out for there for you and you're getting out there for other people to hopefully be inspired and touch moved. And, mm -hmm. and it, when you have that intention, it just, it just, I don't know. It's like a fire. People really feel that. Absolutely. I mean, you've got the fire just in your, in your voice and your, your laugh, everything, because you're doing entrepreneurial things, exciting things. And I think a lot of people, they need that and they don't have it. And I, I encourage them to, whether it's they write their own book or they start something, a side hack or whatever it's going to be, because that's when you really get excited. You go to bed looking forward to waking up the next day to get more work done because you love it so much. And isn't that a beautiful thing, Heather? It's just a lot beautiful. of people don't, I, I want them to experience that. Yeah. And I love your stories because I always share that Bible's the one of the oldest books in, in yeah. the world, right? And the reason why we can read it today, uh -huh. why we can connect with it on any level you want, Lego, not whatever, what your belief is, yeah, is because it's storytelling. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Right? It's storytelling. Uh -huh. It's human to human. It's that experience. And I think that there needs to be more books like yours, but there needs to be more people out there actually experiencing new things because that's uh -huh. one of the things that we, uh, I feel our society kind of lacks right now. Yeah. So I really empower you. Where can people find you? Where can people say, I want to hang out with you because you're super cool um, or just work with you in, in your business level? Where can they find you? So there, I've got a, a bunch of things happening, but the easiest place is the central place of ericsteverson.com and it's E-R-I-K S E V E R S E N dot com. And uh, we're gonna have a landing page for your listeners too, and I'll share you what that what, what that is um, later too. So that you have something dedicated for your guys, a few chapters from the book they can see, a few pictures from some of the crazy adventures, and uh, a few other free resources that, that your listeners might like as well. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna state the URL one more time. It's E R I K S E R sorry, S E V. E R S E N. So that's E R I K S E V E R S E N 
dot com. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Okay, where you know, so I want to wrap it up. And as far as your business and what you're creating and what you're doing for um, local businesses, or yeah. what do you do? You work for corporate businesses, both businesses and individuals, and uh, yeah, so uh, both of them. Okay, got it. And what do you do for them? Oh, okay, <clears throat> so the main thing is. Either I make them more confident in their English so they can succeed in their careers or educations with that, or um, a lot of my students started off as English language, and I, I had to say to them after a little bit, you know what, English isn't your biggest drawback, it's maybe management skills or business sense, and so I, I work with them with that as well. Oh. So I do a lot of both. Do you work with executives or do you work with, like, what, what inside the corporation, who do you usually work with? Sales, um, Marketing. So either it would be the whole team in a business or a lot of it is just up and coming young middle level, level managers are, uh, and entrepreneurs who have their own thing going. That's actually a really, really big segment is somebody who's trying to get their own thing going. And I have coaches that have helped me and that's, I think everybody should both have a coach or multiple and be a coach. And that's kind of where I'm at. I still have coaches that I learn from all the time. And then I have people who are kind of behind me in this path a little bit that I like to help. And so my whole idea is just to make people's lives more fulfilled by showing them that they're, they're, they can reach bigger goals than they think they can. I love the fact that you're an extraordinary life. But so first of all, I want to say that to everybody. Uh, if you're a coach, you need to, be, you need to have a coach. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If you're a coach and you don't have a coach, you're not a coach to me. I mean, yeah. Tony Robbins, dude, has got like five coaches or something. Exactly. Point, right? I mean, Oprah has coaches. Uh -huh. I do, because people who are performers like that have to make sure that they're being, I mean, who's going to hold Tony Robbins accountable? You know what I mean? Like, who's yeah. going to hold the coach accountable? Um, my, I have two coaches right now. I'm actually about to hire a third for training. And I, they hold me account to another, another level. Absolutely. So when I work with clients and I can hold them to another, I can hold them to another level with true integrity. Yeah. Right? So I think it's really important what you're creating, what you're doing. So um, we need to wrap it up real quick because I'm coming up on time clock. Uh -huh. um, but uh, tell us more where they can find you. Okay. So yeah, Eric, uh, it's www.ericseverson.com. And that's the jumping spot for everything. And, and definitely look for the book coming out. It should be on Amazon in late August, 2018. Awesome. Okay, everyone. This is Heather Havenwood. Check out Eric and his book on Amazon coming soon. What's the name of the book? Ordinary to Extraordinary. Ordinary to Extraordinary. I love that. That's great. Check that out on Amazon. Ordinary to Extra Extraordinary. And his website again is ericseverson.com. I'm going to repeat it one more time. E-R-I-K-S-E-V-E-R-S-E-N. All right, everyone. This is Heather Havenwood. Check me out at heatherhavenwood.com.